So where we where we left off, Japan um, and and remember, it wasn't the Japanese government in support of it? It was that Kwangtung Army, the Japanese army in Manchuria, that launched what became known as the Manchurian Incident or the Manchurian Crisis, um, where Japan would conquer uh, Manchuria. And they also bombed Shanghai during uh, during that operation. Zheng Jishi, the nationalist leader of China, would sign an agreement with Japan, not because he loved Japan, but because he saw Japan as a lesser threat at the time compared to what greater threat for him? Communism and, and Mao Zedong. So that needed to be dealt with. So a treaty is reached between Japan and China. Japan now controls Manchuria, but we're not going to call it Manchuria anymore. We're going to call it Manchu Kuo. Very good. And here we go. Now we're pushing through the 1930s. Now, this is not a good time for Japan. It's not a good time for their economy, the Great Depression, and it's not a good time for, for political stability in Japan. It's known as the Dark Valley in Japanese history. The Dark Valley. The years of political and military division in Japan uh, in the mid-1930s. Not only is there competition between the military trying to gain more control of the Japanese government, but there's also, within the military itself, rival factions that evolve, uh, that have uh, different viewpoints as to what Japan's military should be doing um, in the years to come. I'm going to give you these two factions. Um, this is not like, this is kind of like deep in the weeds stuff here. I just want you to kind of have the understanding that not every Japanese officer uh, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other. We've got two rival factions. The Kotoha and the Toseha. Kotoha is known as the Imperial Way. And Toseha is known as the control faction. But that's still impossible to memorize or to remember for us. That doesn't mean much. So let me give you a little bit more. Both of these factions thought the Japanese military should have control of the government. These guys, the Kodoha, were like the radicals. They, they saw like a radical overtaking, maybe using violence, like a coup d'etat, as the way to take control of the Japanese government. All right? These were the radicals. They thought like violence could be used to take over the Japanese government. They also saw the Soviet Union as enemies. The Kodoha saw the Soviet Union as the chief rival to, to the Japanese state, and that the Soviet Union needed to be dealt with. Whereas the Toseha, they also wanted control of the government. The military wanted control of the government. But they wanted to do it through legal means, through appointments, and, and once you have appointments, you can push for more appointments, and ultimately have the military in control. And these guys did not see the Soviet Union as their chief rival. They saw China as the primary uh, focus of the Japanese military. Because China needed to be taken, so you could have the resources from China to continue to strengthen Japan and ultimately deal with other threats like maybe the Soviet Union down the road. So understand, yes ma'am, Um, when you say the people, who... Oh, yeah, there, there was a ton of it, but they weren't thinking... This, this wasn't like, so the Chinese people would now become a part of your country. This was so the Chinese could be, like, exploited for your own benefit. This is, they, they're not ever going to become Japanese. That's not in, in the cards. It's just using the land and the resources more so. And if they're the people there, they will then work for you. You're cool with that. No issue there. 
So anyway, we've got these two rival factions in the Japanese military. And it's important to bring these two factions up because they lead to a lot of the political crises that Japan will, will deal with in the 1930s. Now, there's actually a, a series of assassinations in the 1930s that, that bring more political instability to Japan. I just want to focus on one. In 1932, the Japanese Prime Minister, another Japanese Prime Minister, we talked about one of these a couple days ago, a guy named um, Inukai, I-N-U-K-A-I, Prime Minister Inukai, was assassinated by a conspiracy between naval and army officers in what becomes known as the May 15th Incident. But when these officers were put on trial, the public, who's like reading about the trial in the newspapers and whatnot, the public is offering widespread support for the military and the conspirators. And we've already dealt with it. Well, we just read this, this, this source the other day, or a few minutes ago, about um, how much the people loved the military and the actions of the military. And it's only going to grow stronger after a triumphant victory in conquering Manchuria. So even though like, it should turn our stomachs to hear like, a, a prime minister being assassinated, when the public gives their support to the military, what does it do? It further strengthens the military's role in that government. And so going forward, we're going to see stronger control of the military and the government. The question is, is it going to be Kotoha or is it going to be Toseha? So these, are, these two rival factions are competing for that control. In 1935, in 1935, the leader of the Toseha faction is assassinated. And 1,500 Kotoha officers will march on Tokyo in an attempt to take over the government. They're trying to execute a coup here. Remember, these are the guys that see that like military coups are legit. It's a good way to get control of the government. Yes? So Toseha was in charge of the government? Not yet. No, the government is still civilian, but the military is like gaining more control over that government. But now... After um, the assassination of a Toseha leader, a Kotoha army, essentially, 1,500 soldiers, start marching on Tokyo. Now, the coup will fail. The coup will fail. But it further demonstrates how fragile this Japanese government is. But following this coup, the Kotoha will be discredited and the Toseha will be on the rise. So, essentially, these guys that were more radical, that saw violent action as a way to take over the government, and they're going to try to do that, it's not going to work out for them. And the Toseha, those that still wanted to control the government, but not through violent radical means, will begin to gain more control in China. In July, yes, or in, in Japan, pardon me, yes. How did they fail? How did, how did the coup fail? Yes. Uh, they... There is still a government, and there's still a government security force, and there's still a military, and the Kotoha is just one faction of that military. So the Toseha, they don't want to see this coup be successful. In July of 1937, a guy whose name we're going to get to know very well, Hideki Tojo, he's a Toseha general. He is named the commander-in-chief of the Kwangtung Army in Manchuria. And with the Toseha, now the more powerful of these two factions, after Kotoha had been put down, with the Toseha, the more powerful of the two factions, what becomes Japan's primary focus of their military? China. Remember, the, the Kotoha thought it should have been the Soviet Union. But now that these guys are in firm control of the military, China becomes the focus. And in, in uh, 1937, he is made commander-in-chief of the, of the uh, Kwangtung Army in July of 1937. Within weeks, 
that Kwangtung army and the Japanese military would begin its second war against the nation of China. This is also called the Sino-Japanese War. This is also called the Sino-Japanese War. But you need to maybe remember the year, the 1937 Sino-Japanese War, or you can just call it the Second Sino-Japanese War. You'll see Sino-Japanese War of 1937 versus Sino-Japanese War of 1894, or the First versus the Second Sino-Japanese War. War will break out at what is called the Marco Polo Bridge. Outside of Beijing on July 7, 1937. War breaks out at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing. Now, in your standards, we call it the Marco Polo Bridge Incident. The only incident we need to concern ourselves with is this is where the war begin between the Japanese army and the Chinese uh, begins. Now, there's a little bit of like a story behind it. A, a Japanese soldier comes up missing. Japan is mad. Where's our soldier? Fighting kind of starts. The next day, that soldier is like kind of back in his barracks. He's okay. Oh, weird. Um, but, but for our purposes here, war starts at the Marco Polo Bridge. We don't much care about it. Now there's war between Japan and China. Uh, Jiane and then Saran. Uh, Beijing, China. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That was just an example of the frailty of the Japanese government at the hands of the military. Military officers trying to gain more control of the government assassinated the prime minister. Yeah. But ultimately, the faction of the assassins, the faction of the coup d'etat kind of guys, they lost out. They lost out. Toseha controlled it now. So now we have war. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yep, take, take China, take China so you can ex, uh, exploit their resources. So Japan is now fighting in Beijing. They're also soon to be fighting in uh, the southern part of China around Shanghai. And here's a map, like, so here we have Korea, Japan's over here, there's Manchuria. And now the Second Sino-Japanese War will take the war to what we call mainland China. So Japan is uh, fighting throughout China. They are being supported by devastating air raids from the Japanese Air Force. We begin to see what is going to come in the Second World War when we start to see the mass civilian casualties uh, brought by the Japanese Army in China and by the Japanese Air Force. Now, the Japanese national, or pardon me, the Chinese nationalist government under Zheng Jishi, Chiang Kai-shek, Zheng Jishi, originally they're in Beijing. But then they flee when the war begins to a city called Nanjing, or Nanking, you might see it as. And so very soon, that city becomes the target of the Japanese military. Now, the government will flee again to another Chinese city called Chongqing, but Nanking is the one, or Nanjing is the one that history most remembers because of the horrid atrocities of the Japanese military against the civilians of that city. In what is now known as the Rape of Nanking, or the Rape of Nanjing, tens of thousands of Chinese civilians will be raped, murdered, no distinction between women or man or elderly or young. In fact, I, I had a hard time when I was like just grabbing some images to, to throw up here, um, this of victorious Japanese soldiers um, is, is not the only image of, of this story of the Sino-Japanese War. But most of them are, are, while they're there, and they should be there, and they should exist so we can see what was done, um, this is too much. Uh, one anecdote um, that, that, um, that I read, there's a book called The Rape of Nanking by an, an uh, author named Iris Chang. I think I've got it back there if anybody is interested. Uh, two Japanese officers in the midst of this occupation of this city uh, started a contest to see who could behead 100 civilians first. And newspaper reporters were following them around, reporting back to, to the homeland um, who was in, in the lead here. And then as they get around 90-some, they lost count. So they had to start over uh, from the beginning. 
And, and this is just like one of, of, of dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of the atrocities that still to this day the Japanese government has not owned up to um, in, in the city of Nanking. So it is, it is the worst of humanity from the Japanese military to the Chinese civilians. Japan had hoped that through this sudden attack and through the violent atrocities committed, that the Chinese would surrender, that the Chinese would give in, and that the Chinese would sign unequal treaties with Japan, just like Japan and China were once made to sign with European and American powers. But that didn't happen. The Japanese failed to account for the, 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 the absolute desire to win from the nationalists in China. Chinese nationalism. Now, I'm not just talking about Zheng Jishi and the, like, literally nationalist party. I'm talking about the nationalist sentiment. The idea in China that China is for Chinese and that outsiders should be kept out. That is strong, not just from Zheng Jishi and the nationalists, but also from Mao Zedong and the communists. They had a common idea of keeping outsiders out. And so after Japan begins to attack China the civil war that had been going on in China for a decade now between the nationalists and the communists, that comes to a stop. And their forces focus on the Japanese invasion. And then the Chinese outrage over the, the atrocities at places like Nanking. This is when, when, the, when the Japanese are, are literally raping women and children to death and, and butchering civilians, this is not something that you can then sit down at a table and work out an agreement with. And so there is no surrender from the Chinese. They will continue the fight. And they will continue the fight all the way up until 1945 when the war comes to an end. It is not an easy fight for Japan. China's a big country. And China's got the largest population in the world. And as China pushes further and further from Manchuria and Korea... They're getting further from their supply lines. They're stretching their supply lines thin. All the while, Chinese guerrillas and the nationalist forces of Zheng Jishi and the communist forces of Mao Zedong are fighting them. This is not an easy fight. Now, Japan did their darndest to bring the Chinese along. This is a little propaganda piece from the, from the Japanese where... A young Japanese kid and a Manchurian kid and a Chinese kid are all like waving their flags and being proud together, standing together in what becomes known by the Chinese or by the Japanese, pardon me, as the Greater East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere. They were in desperate need of a good advertising agent. Um, the Greater East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere. Japan wasn't trying to create a Japanese empire, says Japan. Japan was trying to bring greater riches and independence to all East Asia, because Europeans and Americans had long been dominating it. So with the creation of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, Japan and Manchuria, Manchu Kuo now, and China can all get together and reap the economic benefits that would come after we drove the foreigners out. China ain't going to buy this, right? This is not going to work for China, especially after the atrocities committed by the Japanese. China does not surrender, as Japan had hoped. As the years press on, the military will exert more and more control over the civilian government. And by October of 1941, that general of the Kwangtung Army that is leading forces into China, Hideki Tojo, he is named the Prime Minister of Japan. So now it is, it's finally happened. We have a military man that is now the leader of the civilian government. Now, brief time out. I, I, I don't want you to, to write this down. I just want you to listen to it, because you're going to write plenty in, in another week or so. While this is happening, this, this war, this Second Sino-Japanese War, starts in 1937. There's things going on in Europe at the time, too. Nothing happens in a vacuum, right? Just because big issues are going on in one corner of the, the world doesn't mean they're not happening in another. 
In September of 1939, the Second World War uh, is going to begin. All right? September of 1939, the Second World War in Europe begins. The Nazis invade Poland. We're going to talk about this. Nazis invade Poland, um, and then they will turn their sights on to Western Europe. By 1940, France falls. All right? We're going to, we'll fill in a lot more details on this story in, in a couple weeks. In 1940, France falls. When France falls, the nation of France will be divided. The northern part of France, where Paris is, that's going to be occupied by the Nazis. The southern part of France will become, much like Manchukuo was, a puppet government of the Nazis. The Germans will control, essentially, this new France, which, anybody know the name of it? Yes. It's called Vichy France. It's based on a city in southern France called Vichy. But France, if you remember, had holdings in Asia. France controlled what we call French Indochina, today's Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos in Southeast Asia. Well, after France is occupied by the Nazis, conquered by the Nazis, Japan will work out a deal with the new French government, which is really a Nazi puppet, to allow them to station armies in Southeast Asia. So they can begin to use airfields in Southeast Asia. They can begin to station troops in Southeast Asia. And we can only imagine if you're going to put troops and air force down in Southeast Asia, you're eventually going to use it, right? Keep that in the back of your mind. As there's war in Europe getting rolling, as we've got war in Europe getting ready to roll, Japan will sign on to a, number, a couple treaties in hopes of strengthening Japanese prospects once the war comes to an end. First, here's the Japanese and the Germans, there's Adolf Hitler, signing what is known as the Tripartite Pact. Tripartite, three-party, Tripartite Pact. Germany, Italy, and Japan sign what becomes known as the Tripartite Axis Pact. Now, the Axis powers. We'll talk about this again in a, in a week or two. And the axis, like the Earth rotates on its axis. Like, every, it, it all goes around one central imaginary line, right? So, for Germany and Italy, who was the original axis, Europe is revolving around those two, right? Well, now Japan is brought into the fold. Germany and Italy in this agreement, Germany and Italy would dominate Europe, while Japan could dominate East Asia. Now, what, is, what, are, what do the Germans and the Italians get out of this deal? What do the Germans and the Italians get out of this deal? Well, they get an ally in Japan. And this is Adolf Hitler playing the long game. We're talking about 1939 here, right? Adolf Hitler knows, but he's the only one that knows, he knows he's eventually going to go to war with the Soviet Union. It ain't happening yet. It won't happen until June of 1941. But he's eventually going to go to war with the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union has more of what Adolf Hitler wants than any other country, and that's land. So he's eventually going to go to war with the Soviet Union. Well, who borders the Soviet Union in the, in the east? It's Japan now. And so if, if the Soviet Union had to one day fight both the Germans in the West and the Japanese in the East, then the Soviets would be stuck in a two-front war. All right? Adolf Hitler doesn't have any deep love for Japanese people. He is just as racist and bigoted towards them as he would be towards any non-Aryan. But he needs them. And as we'll learn about Adolf Hitler, he uses who he needs until he doesn't need them anymore, right? Now, what does Japan get out of this deal? Well, they are promised, once the war in Europe is done, all those European powers that the, the Nazis are going to defeat, like Germany, or, like Britain, and like France, of course, um, that, that after the war, Japan can have their Asian colonies, because Europe is going to be dealing, Europe is going to be German. Were they promised India? Huh? Uh, I don't know that they were promised India, and I'm going to say I 
doubt that one. I'm thinking Southeast Asia and the 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 Indonesia. What is say Indonesia from the Dutch? Uh, I, I don't. I would highly doubt India. I would highly doubt India, but I don't know that. Uh, so that is the tripartite path. But then to make your you scratch your head, but to understand that treaties are only temporary arrangements. In April of 1941. Japan will sign a neutrality act, or a neutrality pact, pardon me, a neutrality treaty with the Soviet Union. This, exactly. So, even though I just said Adolf Hitler is eventually going to invade the Soviet Union, it doesn't happen until June of 1941. Prior to that, Hitler himself has, a, has, a, has a, a treaty agreement with the Soviet Union to not attack them and the Soviets won't attack Germany. This is Japan doing the same thing. All right? What this does for Japan as we look at the map again, what this is going to do for Japan as we look at the map again, is it's going to make secure the northern frontier. If you work out an agreement with the Soviets, you're not going to attack them, they're not going to attack you. Now you don't have to worry about stationing a lot of troops in the north. If you're not stationing a lot of troops in the north, you can focus on the south, where China is. You can focus on Southeast Asia, the islands of Indonesia, the Philippines, and others. Yes? How do they know the Soviets aren't going to go back on it? Very good question. The Soviets are completely busy in Europe right now. The Soviets invade, and we'll, we will put all these pieces together once we start talking about what's going on in Europe. But when the Germans invade Poland, the Soviets do the same thing. And then the Soviets take over Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and the Soviets go to war against Finland. The Soviet Union has got a lot going on in Europe right now. They don't need a war in the Pacific. All right? So it's a mutually beneficial thing. Now, how do they know they're not going to break it at some point? You never do. You never do. Um, all right. So they've got these agreements. And now Japan begins to move more troops into Southeast Asia. They begin to move more troops into Indochina. This leads the United States, who is now looking at a war in China between Japan and, and the United States, now seeing the, the Japanese move more military towards even American colonial holdings and American interests in the Philippines, now the United States starts to act a little bit more. In 1941, with Japan moving more arms to Southeast Asia, the United States will freeze all Japanese assets in the United States. So if there's Japanese businesses that have money and monies in American banks, they will be frozen. Japan can't have access to those monies. Same kind of things we do when we find out like some organization is supporting international terrorism or something. We might freeze their assets so you can't get them out. And we put an embargo on selling raw materials and steel to Japan. We will cut Japan off from our steel shipments. We will cut Japan off even more crucially at the time from oil. We were where Japan got most of their oil from. And we're going to cut them off. This could be a disaster for the Japanese war plans. If the Americans stop selling Japan oil, if we stop steel shipments, Japan can't put together the military and carry out the, the goal of conquering East Asia. So Japan needs America to open up these shipments again. And through 1941, Japanese diplomats in Washington, D.C. will be talking with Americans about how we can work out this situation. But Japan knows that the situation will never be worked out. Because the only thing that we would accept from Japan, the only way we would end our embargo with Japan, is if Japan stopped the aggressive actions towards East Asia and Southeast Asia. Well, Japan isn't going to do that because they need to because they want to ultimately dominate so they can be economically self-sufficient. So the only thing that we would accept is the one thing that Japan wouldn't do. And so war was going to come. 
So even while Japanese diplomats are talking to American diplomats, all the way up until November of 1941, the Japanese army and navy are putting together an attack plan to strike at the United States at our naval base at Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. It is the base of, of the American Mid-Pacific Fleet. Yes? Sorry, how do you spell O-A-H-U, Oahu. It is the base of our Mid-Pacific Fleet. It's pretty much halfway between the United States and Japan. And with negotiations between the Americans and the Japanese coming to a, an end, with, uh, with them failing, the Japanese Navy will launch a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Japanese bombers and fighter aircraft from aircraft carriers in the Pacific will strike at the U.S. Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. They also simultaneously attack Hong Kong. We'll go back to our map here. They simultaneously attack Hong Kong and Singapore. On the next day, they open up against the Philippines, where the Americans had thousands of, of troops stationed. They attack Thailand, or Siam as it was known at the time. They move into the Malay Peninsula, Malaya, which was a British colony. This is Japan beginning World War II in Asia. On the day after the attack at Pearl Harbor, on December 8, 1941, the United States declares war on Japan. Almost unanimously. One holdout congresswoman that does not agree to declare war. Does anybody know her name? I want to say Jeanette Rankin, I believe, is the name, because she's, she's also one of the only women, uh, per, uh, Congress people that didn't vote to go to war in uh, World War I. So she's kind of got the claim to fame for that one. Uh, not that she supported any of these actions, she was just a pacifist. So the United States declares war on Japan on December 8, 1941. The attack at Pearl Harbor was devastating. But it was not as devastating as the Japanese had hoped it would be. While 90% of the American ships that were at Pearl Harbor were either destroyed or severely damaged, American aircraft carriers weren't in the harbor. And as we're going to hear through the story of the Second World War, aircraft carriers are the lifeblood of navies. All right? Aircraft carriers is how you project your Navy's forces, um, and you can obviously take air forces with you, uh, beyond uh, um, your land bases. Our aircraft carriers were out to sea, so they weren't destroyed in this attack, despite many other American ships being destroyed, and, 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 and very important ones, like the USS Arizona here. Has anybody ever been to Pearl Harbor? Okay, it's, it's a place to go to. If you ever get, are, are lucky enough to go to Hawaii uh, and you go to Oahu, uh, you got to go to Pearl Harbor to check it out because it's, it's probably one of the most moving um, military memorials I've ever been to. Uh, you can't really make it out here. Let me grab the lights really quick and you might see it better. Uh, there it is. Uh, so this is the USS Arizona Memorial. The memorial is built atop of now the sunken uh, battleship. This circle here, these are the big gun turrets, okay? They would, they would swing. Those are the heavy guns from the battleship. Um, but what is so powerful about it, and when you go on the memorial, you see all the guys' names, um, there are hundreds of sailors that are entombed within this ship. Um, they, they don't take them out. It, it would be a dangerous operation to get those bodies out of there. So they are at rest with the ship. But the ship, still to this day, leaks oil. So every minute or so, a little droplet of oil makes its way to the, uh, the surface of the, of the harbor there, and you see this little, like, rainbow oil slick start to spread out. Uh, it's not an environmental concern. We're not talking about a major oil spill here. It's just a little trickle, and it gives you this eerie sense that, like, there's life on there, that there's, like, still 
It's it's not just you know going and looking at a statue or a cannon or something, for like that there's that there's life on that ship. I, I just got goosebumps even even remembering it here. So it's definitely something to check out. So the the, the attack was devastating. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll talk much more about those as we get into the war. So we have declared war, but Japan's goal with Pearl Harbor ultimately failed. Their hope was to have such a devastating attack against our Navy that we couldn't fight against them. That we would just have to be like, huh, you got us, Japan. We're out. We can't fight a war against you because we have no more Navy to do anything against you because you're so far away. And now you can take all of East Asia with impunity. So the best we can do, so your Navy is not sneaking up onto our Pacific border, the best we can do is to work out a treaty to end this war. And one of the things that Japan would want is for us to start selling them oil again. That didn't happen. Kind of like, the, the, like they, mis, uh, they underestimated the Chinese and their willingness to fight and their ability to fight. They did the same with the United States. And so the United States would absolutely not surrender. We would declare war on Japan, and we would ultimately bring the defeat of the Japanese uh, nation by 1945. I have two hands, and then we're done. Yes? Um, how did they attack with arms? With, with airplanes based from aircraft carriers. So, because Japan is too far away, you can't fly from Japan or anything like that. So they were they were bombers and and dive dive bombers and fighter planes uh, from aircraft carriers that that bombed Pearl Harbor. Yes, not our entire navy, but a good chunk of it. Um, our biggest Pacific fleet, our, our the base of the American Pacific fleet is is was then and is still in San Diego, California. Uh, but this was our mid Pacific fleet. Um, this is where ships would go and refuel, and this, this was a, a vital stopping point in the American Pacific Fleet. Um, that is 